everybody, it's Bob Henderson here, and I'm doing an add-on from a little glitch that happened with the uh, uh, audio for the Wednesday night Wilderness Canoe Association uh, breakout session, Room One Talk. And so I'm going to revisit uh, what I did on Wednesday night for the first half, and then it's going to be spliced into the second half, uh, so you'll see the this true spirit of the rant. Uh, this is uh, less rant-oriented and a little bit more... Uh, it, yeah, a little bit more uh, staged, if you will. So uh, the title of this was No Wilderness Superheroes. And I want to unpack those three words quickly. So first word, no. Yes, I'm being negative about something. I'm uh, very consciously uh, acknowledging that uh, I'm working from the negative. I'm providing a critique. Hopefully critique is understood to mean a, a thoughtful exploration. But it is from a negative view, and which is a little bit strange for me, because I think if you know me, I usually work from the positive. And I did write a paper about working from the positive, which is called a playful exercise in uh, creating a, a adventure uh, narrative uh, continuum, and that can be found uh, on my on my website. So that's sort of a little disclaimer that I'm I'm conscious of working from the negative. The second word is wilderness. And I think it's a very problematic word, and I just want to make sure people uh, appreciate that I understand it's it's problematic. I'm kind of of the opinion, well, I am of the opinion that it's kind of an inert idea. Um, in a time of Canadian decolonization and people being somewhere on a continuum of their own decolonizing journey or not at all, I wonder about the word wilderness. Um, uh, some people say it's a state of mind. I wonder if that's wise now. Uh, other people say, uh, well, I would say, has there ever been any wilderness? Um, I mean, it's it's home for a lot of people. So it depends on where you stand on issues of ind indigeneity, I suppose. So I just think it's a problematic word. And where I really have problem with it is when it gets used in the sort of Star Trek way of uh, the wilderness explorer who boldly goes where no man has gone before. That's when I have a lot of problem with the word because uh, that's just uh, an oppressive move on indigenous peoples. And that is happening uh, in our literature and, and in presentations. So the word wilderness is at least problematic. Next is the word superhero. And um, what I'm really talking about is the look at me, you can't do this. Wilderness superhero uh, adventure narrative or explorer adventurer. I'm, I, I find that what, I mean, my position on this is um, go on the trip. I mean, you do whatever you want. I'm not an arrogant guy on this front. Please go ahead. <laughs> um, but uh, what, where the concern is for me is when the adventure becomes fabricated to suit uh, what I'm going to call a media event, which is a word meant, to, a phrase meant to carry, cover a lot of ground. So I really worry about the key word here is sham. The sham that ensues when your narrative has to be fabricated to compete with the last narrative, and there's going to be one that's going to come out that's going to be more fabricated and, and more extreme than yours. So I, I worry about the problem of creating the superhero i think it's a access denier in a lot of ways so those are the words unpacked briefly next i'm terribly aware of a what i'm going to call a defensible paradox and what is what that is is i'm in the process of attracting as much attention as i can with the spirit of acknowledging that you have to attract attention if you want to speak out against the quest for attention seeking. So that's a paradox. Um, and I'm just acknowledging that as well. So, I mean, I, I've written a couple of papers on this. I have, uh, they're getting circulated. I'm keen to speak on this topic. Um, I uh, acknowledge I joined Facebook in the last three months in part to share ideas. So, and Instagram and everything else. So these are all, this is all new to me and I'm kind of, I've got other topics, but I'm, I'm speaking out. Um, so those are the three words unpacked, no wilderness superheroes and my 
paradox acknowledged. The next thing is we have this cultural psychological trap. And what it is essentially is a quest for attention. Perhaps the story that uh, made, you know, I think everybody has a touchstone on this. Uh, I have a couple. One was a hike in the Lake O'Hara district. And I was looking down on two people that were uh, climbing up and they'd stopped. We were all in heavy clothes. It was a cold, cold time. And um, the two individuals were young in their early 20s and they'd taken off their shirts, which meant to me they were gonna get quite cold quickly. And they started picking up rocks and uh, bench, press, bench pressing them. I mean, literally, aggressively bench pressing these rocks. And we were watching from above, looking down, and then eventually we came down to them. And, you know, what do you guys, what was that all about? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, no worries. Yeah, we're just trying to pump up our muscles and then uh, take off our shirts, pump up our muscles, and get a few quick pics for Instagram. And this is on a glorious day and a lovely hike. And that quest for attention just really hit me hard in that moment. The next one's perhaps more on topic, and that is that quest for attention where you're reading somebody's travelogue and you've been to the site and, and you know that the rapid in, dis, in question has 50 meters of dead calm water river right on the inside bend. And to hit a couple of waves on the outside is just ludicrous if, if you can avoid it, because those waves are pretty big. And, and then to hear somebody write about the rapid like it's a crazy dangerous rapid when, when you know it. I mean, that, that kind of phenomena is pretty rampant and it, 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 it irks me. And then there was a fellow who was on a trip that I wasn't on and said, well, when he, he read about the author who had written up the trip, he'd read about wolves taking down a moose on a lake and i said oh yeah I, I read that piece he said yeah what actually happened was we just happened to see a moose on a lake it was a nice wilderness it was a nice wildlife encounter so there's a little phenomena there with embellishing your adventure and then there's this extra problem with the last story of disney disneyfying nature and you know the problem is People won't go because they, they think that all the rapids are dangerous or people won't have the experience that people write about in terms of its, its um, nature phenomena of a wolves taking down an animal, uh, a moose on a lake, and they'll go, well, you know, Disney's better, essentially. You know, it, the trips never measure up. A publisher might say to somebody, well, why don't you write stories like X? And the answer is because they don't really happen that way very often. So I think what I'd like to do is raise a doubt, be wary reader. Um, I think it, it could be that you're getting, you're getting a bit of a sham. And I'm speaking out against that. And I'd like to thank my friend, Karsten Ewer, who uh, helped me finesse my argument on this. Um, and I'm purposely being a bit cheeky. I'm acknowledging, um, friends over decades who have helped me, but I don't want to take myself too seriously, if you will. So let's make this fun. And um, the first thing that I want to talk about is what I'm going to call the PSD, and that's place, speed, and distance. And what I'd like to say here is that these are a problem in that you have place, speed, and distance are categories. We'll talk about place first. You have this thing called objective firsts. And the problem for the canoeists today is that there aren't many firsts left out there, if there are any. And of course, you can make them up, but they could be really pointless exercises. Um, they simply don't really make sense. They have no historical or even geography context. Um, an example of a geography context that doesn't really work is to travel for 50 days against the flow of the land in Labrador by going north, south, or south to north. What would it matter? When most of the land and the rivers and the water and um, uh, landform is, is, is moving on an east and west plane, um, it's, it's a real grunt of a brutal, punishing trip to, to then travel against the grain of the land. Why would you do that other than? for the media event and to have a, 
a grunt-like experience. And I, I don't get it. So those are objective firsts. I mean, I can crack a joke about, uh, well, you could carry a piano across the Chilkoot Gold Rush Trail. And then I'm remembering that Pierre Burton actually noted that somebody did that. You know, okay, well then carry a fridge across the uh, Athabasca Pass. You know, I, I'm trying to be absurd, but I'm, I'm suggesting that objective firsts are, um, are hard to come by. Now, subject, subjective firsts, we have all the time. Every time you go on a trip and, and uh, you go with a new group of friends, you see new terrain, or you revisit an old route. I, I've revisited one route in the Tomogamy area because uh, I used to guide canoe trips on it uh, at least 40 times I've been on that route. And I'm, I'm dying to get back to it. I haven't been there for a few years. So these are subjective firsts. That's not what I'm talking about. This quest for the objective first is often now putting us canoeists uh, into this category of kind of the, 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 the pointless, brutal trip that out competes the last one. Then there's this other notion of speed, and we'll call those FKTs, first known time. Um, uh, uh, fa sorry, excuse me, fastest known time. It's a little bit like the, f the slow food movement. Compare that to the fast food movement. I mean, Bill, Bill Mason is famous for saying, um, uh, when somebody said, well, why are you using these uh, wood canvas uh, uh, prospector canoes? He said, well, uh, you know, they're slow, people would say. Well, Bill responded with, well, why would I want to go fast? Uh, my friend Rick Dredeger uh, in, in uh, Saskatchewan, people, as an outfitter, people say to him, well, how, how quickly can I do this trip? How many days is this trip? His answer is always the same. Take as long as you can. So I guess I'm, um, um, I'm kind of speaking out against the speed notion because there, are, there, is a lot of, there is a lot of counting kilometers going on out there. And aren't there better things to count? <laughs> I mean, um, count the, the best chocolate cakes you've made on the trail, uh, good bannocks, you know, uh, swimming holes, the pictograph sites you've visited. There's got to be better things to count than kilometers. All right. What happens when you count kilometers is you turn your trip into a grunt experience and feel free to do it. My goodness, what do I care? It's when you write a book or give a speech about it that is the problem. If you wanna go on a grunt, go on a grunt. Just don't write about it. There's nothing to say. You don't visit heritage sites. You don't have time to fish. You don't cook, you eat granola bars. I don't get it. I mean, I really don't get it. Okay, then there's the distant ones. So they are FKDs. That's the fastest known distance. And they're just missing the point. <laughs> okay. So all this Guinness Book of World Record seeking is, strikes me anyway, as hollow, shallow, pointless. But when it goes public, it's lacking principle because it almost always comes with sham and embellishments. And most people, not you folks, don't know the sham and they don't know the embellishments. So they take it all in and it's a bloody bestseller. And this has been happening for decades. So I could uh, go on and on, I think, but I'm looking at my time and I'd love to sort of see if we could interact a little bit. So uh, I'm from the Literary Review of Canada. I'm just taking a review of a book and they said the journey is impressive, but the story about it is not. Because if you're on one of these grunt journal book, uh, experiences, there's never going to be much of a story, in my opinion. You're not visiting anything. Anyway, that's, that's, that's a take on it. Uh, in that same article, they talk about blinkered maps and, and I would add much worse than blinkered maps, blinkered experience. And so the, the outdoor educator in me is sort of striving for something bigger, uh, cultivating ecological consciousness through the canoe trip, you know, developing a sustainable mindset around our positioning in, in the natural world, something where we are home in nature and nature isn't a sparring partner. Um, 
something where wilderness and nature, sorry, nature can be home. And, and we view it as home and, and uh, not as a place for a Star Trek movie to bravely go where no man has gone before. So I've played around uh, in, on a blog site, uh, in a website of mine called the uh, bobhenderson.ca. And in bobhenderson.ca, I've written this basic rant that I've just gone on. But I, then I've also tried to do the positive, which is the opposite of this, look at me, you can't do this superhero uh, grunt narratives, is a look at this place through me. And, and there are writers that are doing this wonderful work. I made a list, where is it? I mean, P.G. Downs is a famous one. Uh, Robert Perkins, The Shepherdsons. The Shepherdsons wrote a brilliant book called The Family Canoe Trip. You don't learn that, that their daughter's got uh, scoliosis in, in a bad way until page 90, because it just doesn't matter, you know? Um, uh, there's, there's a collection, uh, Herb Pohl, who is well known to many people here, Max Finkelstein and his work with AP Lowe and his own trip across. It isn't the trip that's the problem. It's the messaging of the adventure narrative that says, you can't go, essentially, as an unwit un unwitting response. So I think I'll stop there. And Bruce is my co-host. And, and somehow, uh, Bruce and I have talked about fielding some questions with about maybe 10 minutes. Or do we read the chat, Bruce? Or do I keep talking? <laughs> I, I have a question here. Hello. Okay, right. Okay, well, I just uh, judging. I, I'm just on your website and I can't find that particular article. What is it called? Uh, it's called uh, uh, Thoughts and a Bit of a Rant about the Wilderness Superhero. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's on the travel section of the, my, my uh, blog. Okay. okay. Now, my question uh, I'm a sort of a, a, a fan of Adam Schultz, and he's probably the person you were, you were uh, alluding to in your uh, introduction here. Can you give us a few words about Adam Schultz? Because just to my mind, he does a fair decent combination of the historical, the ecological, and the exploration nonsense. Okay, so, so he's like, he's two thirds good. This was a question that was asked of me, not something that I uh, have uh, intended to do, but I'm, I'm just gonna be very polite and it's kind of literature. Um, uh, if it's embellished to the point that it, that it doesn't really happen, I have a, a real problem with it. Um, uh, I'm not just thinking about Adam Schultz, but certainly uh, he's, he's, he's there uh, in this area. I, I guess I did take, take, take some offense of being an anthropologist and a historian and not stopping at Lookout Point on the Thielen, uh, okay. at the main gathering spot between the Dene and the Innu. I mean, that to me seems unconscionable. And then also not stopping at the Hornby cabin because essentially you're counting kilometers and your entire trip is a race against winter. Go ahead, do it. But the messaging in that isn't good for young people who are aspiring to canoe trips. What does it teach them about the land? Ask yourself, Frank, who benefits? Who well, benefits it's a, and, the, and it's obvious that Adam has, he's an academic, he's building a speaking profile. He needs, uh, he needs the notoriety. I totally get it. Uh, when a canoe trip becomes a media event, you got to be very careful. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, but of let's, course. Let's so, yeah. Uh, Someone else. I see somebody. I'm seeing uh, Bob over there. And uh, I'm seeing Frank, Frank. I, Frank, I totally agree with you uh, about Adam Schultz. That was the exact person that came to mind. I was at his talk here. Uh, I'm in Ottawa, and he spoke at the Royal Geographical Society, and um, I don't think his trip will ever be done again because uh, I don't think he enjoyed the, the canoe ride. But Bob, um, I think the whole thing about nature bathing, and you've got the friend Beth and uh, Barry, that's sort of the antithesis of what you're talking about. Uh, so I really see uh, nature bathing as as the way to slow down and really enjoy uh, being out there. That's yep. my comment. Sure, um, and there is travel literature. I guess my absolute favorite book on this theme would be Nan Shepherd's book, The Living Mountains. 
um, the Living Mountain, which is eventually about hiking in the Cairn Gorms. If I had to go to a canoeing book, boy, it might be Robert Perkins Against Straight Lines, yeah. or, or P.G. Downs, who is so connected to the peoples, or uh, Elliot Merrick, so connected to the peoples. I mean, th th it, there's literature. Uh, that uh, speaks to the other end of the adventure narrative continuum. So Bruce, how are we doing for time and that sort of thing? We've got uh, a couple more minutes. Uh, okay. A couple of questions from Hugh and Joel. Uh, Hugh, if you want to briefly unmute yourself and, and ask a question. Go ahead. Not, sure it's, not sure it's a question. The only quibble I have with you, hi, nice to see you, Bob, is um, the objection to the word wilderness. I remember growing up with Wally Schaber as, uh, as my canoe instructor, and his take was, and I think it's true, I've carried it with me since then, is that wilderness is really a state of mind. It's not the place. For a four-year-old kid, it could be the far end of the schoolyard because it's the first time they've been there, and it's the feeling that it evokes. So I agree entirely with your take, which I would summarize as, I don't want to turn the outdoors into a consumable. I think that uh, trashes its, its spirit. But the idea of wilderness can still apply in a public park in your own neighborhood if you're six and from there on up. So yeah, keep it up. Uh, I'm loving take. it. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, I, I, we have another question or a comment from Joel. Joel, do you want to go ahead? I'm not hearing anything. I, I just had a comment, not a question. So okay. go on to the next one. Oh, no, great. OK. Uh, we have a, a, a question or a comment from Sandy. Go ahead, Sandy. Thank you. I'm wondering if these people that we're talking about are also the same ones who have to be rescued frequently because they don't <laughs> necessarily have the equipment, the gear, or the experience. Just a comment on that or your thoughts about that possibility? Sure. I haven't, I haven't given a lot of thought to that. Most of my focus, Sandy, has been around the idea of if you read this literature, you're probably not going to go because all the bears are rearing up and attacking and, and all the rapids are dangerous. And so, but I do remember a story uh, about a university program that uh, took students on a big time trip really early in their careers. Like, so they're 21 years old and they're doing something really big without any developmental stages to it. And then because they'd done this big adventure, they thought they were better than they were skill-wise, and they were getting in lots of trouble in the mountains. This is a more of a hiking thing. So um, I, I take your point, and I think right away to that story where parks people were, they, they had a name for these folks, and they were usually from the same university program. So I, I think it's a reasonable point. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So kind of a, a question or a, a, from Stephen. Go ahead, Stephen. I suppose that's me. Um, I have a concern in mostly in social media um, of personalities um, that very often have wonderful tripping skills and develop them. And it's much better than mine for sure. Because I've been, but I've been a canoeing educator since I was 21 and I'm in my 60s. And, um, and I rarely see very good canoeing skills and that always worries me you know and 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 even the social media types that are telling you come on you can do these things i'm going i keep thinking the only reason you're surviving these things is dumb luck or you're editing and uh and i have so i have a social media presence and in, in one thing to do with canoe instruction my name's not even on it it's just right. a book well, of skill you know so and you're, you're, it doesn't seem to be any sandy's i'm just for Pardon? sake of time because i just got told we got like four minutes your your, your sure. question is similar to sandy's then isn't it uh, except it's reversed it's that um people are getting out there without the uh, necessary skills 
and and promoting it as if they do. And do you have any fear about that? Because it bothers it worry. I don't want to say bothers me because it sounds, you know, as if I'm em envious, which I probably am. But it's mostly I'm concerned about people. Yeah. To keep it on topic, I think there will be a group of people that envy. I'm going I'm trying to stay on topic. That envy this type of adventure narrative. They envy the peepers people. They 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 envy it in every way. Um, there's also a camp that pity it. So mm. I, I'm representing the camp that, that pities this because of all the things that are missed along the trail. Uh, like Lookout Point on the Thielen. My goodness, it was the highlight of my trip. Frank, you'll know that, Frank. <laughs> um, anyway, um, but um, uh, so if you envy it, you may be more inclined to use that literature to get above where you should be in terms of getting out there with your skill set. So I think that's a, a great comment that I'll, I'll just say quickly. You, you either, you're either in the envy camp or you're in the pity camp. And I think generally speaking, with the more skill you've got, you enter the pity camp. So maybe we have room for another question. Uh, Bob, we have a question from Robert. Okay. Robert, go ahead. Hey, Bob. Hey, hi, Bob. <laughs> My, mine's more of a of, of a of a comment, and, and I think maybe you're uh, more of a critique because I think you're taking a little bit of an idealized uh, look of past literature. And when you look at uh, works like R. M. Patterson or even P. G. P. G. Downs, um, they are crafted in a way to sell books. And in, in Patterson's work, for instance, The Dangerous River, which I'm more familiar with than Downs, you know, there's a distinct divide or disconnect between his journals what he actually recorded and the narrative that he wrote and that narrative you know no one should really follow that what he did and, and you're, you're sort of making that argument like literature in the past is is better than the travel literature today and, and we shouldn't really be following what the, the example of explorers and adventurers today and i, I think we're, we're, we're talking about you know not only we're talking about multiple generation gaps and the commodification of the outdoors and adventure uh, and adventure tourism, which wasn't present with, you know, in Shackleton's narratives or, or PG Downs or, or Patterson or anything like that. So I think, okay, you know, yeah. you need to take a bit of a longer view, I think. You know, my answer to that is it's a great point. Uh, and with 20 minutes, I was all about trying to be <laughs> cheeky and fun. And, um, and not an academic. If I put on my academic hat on, I guess all I say would be, um, I think there was less sham and falsehoods in the older narratives because they didn't have to. But I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure on that, but, right. but it's, it's an opinion. I, I just don't think AP Lowe was after a media event. Well, and I, I think you can also, but you can also look back on, on, um, um, well, it's, I think we're, we're done there, but I'd love to talk to you more about it. Well, we have a chance to, for sure, with uh, yeah. the projects we have going. Um, exactly. hey, I'd like to thank all the people that came on and especially those people who know who you are, who I've corresponded with uh, on this topic over the last uh, few months. And, uh, thanks very much for Bruce for making my life uh, less stressful. So no thanks problem. for all.